Good morning. 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 Good and I want to let you know and to thank and praise God that uh, God is faithful. And, uh, and if you trust God, God will not let you down. Uh, it may not work out the way you want it to, the times you want it to, but God is faithful. Um, we lost contracts that we've had for 20 some years. Okay, they decided to do it in house. So we had to figure out what we're going to do. God has been faithful in giving me work every day. Amen. Because I can't sit at home and do nothing because I would drive my wife crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but God also opened the door for me to be able to uh, start to inspect roofs for the hospital, and that's worked out really, really well. Um, and so, like I said, I just want to thank and praise God. I want to thank you guys for your prayers, for your support. And I just realize that, as Marty said, God is faithful. And if you, if you put your trust in Him and you test Him, He will show you how faithful He is. We get started this morning. I want you to look at this little book of, there's many different ways to pronounce this name here. How did you say it? There you go, I can't do that. So we will say Habakkuk. And I heard another pronunciation of it last week as well. But as we get into these sets of verses, I want you to realize that God answers Habakkuk and he tells him when Habakkuk uh, questions God, why do you allow all this violence? I pray to you day in and day out, and I tell you about our situation. There is evil, there is violence. Um, and yet nothing happens to the wicked. The wicked seem to prosper, and the righteous are stepped on. God, what are you going to do about it? And God answers Habakkuk, and he doesn't answer him in a way I'm sure Habakkuk wanted, but he gives him an answer. And he tells him, um, Ray, do you have that open? Yeah. Can you read verse 4? Sure. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment will never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, keep reading that one and stop at the end of verse 4. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Okay, so what that is saying is that I want you to look at our situation. The justice system is corrupt, it's perverted. The righteous don't get justice, the wicked do. If you have enough money, you can pay your way out of problems. What are you going to do, Lord? And so go ahead and read verse uh, 5. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. Stop. This is God's answer. <laughs> you guys, I want you to look at the heathen nations. And I want you to see that I'm going to do a work among you that if I told you, you wouldn't even believe it. Okay? What was God's answer to the violence and the wickedness? Well, I'm going to get the most violent and wicked nation and have them come and bring justice upon you. But you need to understand what God was actually preparing the people for. As we said last week, Habakkuk and Jeremiah were contemporaries. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Jeremiah, you realize that Jeremiah has been telling the people that the Babylonians are coming. If you guys do not repent and change your ways, the Babylonians are coming and God is going to send you into exile. God does not want to do that. He wants to give you the chance to turn your lives around. But do the people listen to him? And because they don't listen to him, God is going to do a work that nobody would believe, even if he tells it to them. Now, do you know that this set of verses is used in the book of Acts? 
Paul tells the Jews in the synagogue, and he quotes this verse after he gives them the gospel message, that God is going to do a work that even if he told them they wouldn't believe it. But he gives it as a warning for them not to disobey and not to harden their hearts against the gospel message. And the people did the same thing that the Israelites did back in Habakkuk's day. They hardened their hearts and Paul said, we're going to turn to the Gentiles. But it's interesting that he uses that same set of verses now in the book of Acts. It's written a little bit differently, but it's a quote from Habakkuk chapter 1. Okay. I want you to see what kind of nation God is going to raise up. Look among the nations and watch and be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. For indeed I am raising up the who? Another name for the Chaldeans is who? Babylonians. The Babylonians. Okay? Now, that image of the dream that Daniel had, and in that dream, he dreamed of an image. And the head was of gold, the shoulders were of a different metal, and on down. Okay? So, who was this head of gold in this image of this dream? Actually, it wasn't Daniel who had the dream, it was Nebuchadnezzar who had okay, Daniel interpreted it. But who was the head? Who did that represent? Babylon. Babylon, right? God is going to raise up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. And what kind of people are they? They're a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They take what is not theirs and they take it by force. Does this not raise the question of Habakkuk is crying out to God, are you going to do something about the violence that's here in Judah? And God's answer is, I'm going to send the Babylonians who are known for even more violence than what you're experiencing in Judah. The topic of last week, the name of that sermon was God's ways are not our ways. And you need to understand that as you go through your day-to-day -day life and you try to see God in the world today. And you wonder, why does this wickedness happen? Where is God? Is He not powerful enough to stop it? As it was in the days of Habakkuk, so it will be in this day today. We ask the same questions. And sometimes God gives the same answers. They are terrible. They are dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from where? What is that telling you? What does that mean? They're selfish people? It's telling you that they do not know, nor do they follow God. That their God is the God of their own making. Their power comes from themselves. And in their worldview, they are the most powerful thing on earth. Okay? Now, the Chaldeans worship many gods. Is that right? But were, the God, were those gods that they worship true gods or false gods? And so, in the end, who was it that they were given worship to? The devil. The devil. Okay? The horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their charges charge ahead, their cavalry come from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. That's telling you that they are a great military power. And that wherever they go, they conquer and leave ruin and disaster. And they are able to do it quickly. Quickly. They all come for what? I just keep thinking. He's crying about the violence and God's sending more violence. Does God have the right to do this? Yes. Is God just in doing this? There is no if, ands, or buts about this. You need to understand that God is just in this kind of punishment. God is just in how he's working this out. 
And God has a bigger goal here than just answering Habakkuk and bringing justice to the wickedness that's in Judah. You need to understand that. And that bigger goal is that for the generations that will come after the captivity, that they will know and understand who God is and what He requires. What does God require of Christians today? Yes? To love one another. To love one another. That is a requirement. It is a requirement that He gave. He said to love one another. So what is He requiring? For you to be obedient to Him. Right? Isn't that what God asked for the people of Judah? To be obedient to Him? <coughs> and could they be obedient to Him? I see you guys got a little bushy there. So let me ask you a question because I'm going to ask you the next question. Is, can Christians be obedient to God to that? Yes. So... So, could they be obedient to Him? The obedience comes by having a relationship with Him. Why were they disobedient? Because they walked away from Him. They chose not to serve, or a better word for that is love. Right? They chose not to love God and have a loving relationship with Him. And if you choose not to do that, you're not going to be a sinless people, you're not going to be a righteous people, you're going to fall now under the power of the devil. And you will fall under sin. Right? So you're saying that disobedience is a symptom. <coughs> a symptom. Yes. A symptom, and it is also the natural course of not having an intimate relationship with God. Does that sound, does that, does yeah. that make sense to you guys? It could be a choice. It's always a choice. It's always a choice. Very good. So, you think about this. The reason why I ask you this is because I have met so many people who believe that the Old Testament has no bearing on your salvation today. That the way that they were saved is totally different from the way we are saved because we are under grace, they were under law. And I need you to understand that salvation is only found in one person, and that's Jesus Christ. And the book of Revelation tells you that Jesus Christ was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And if that's the case, then they were saved the same way you and I were saved. They had no more power to do good works, to ingratiate themselves to God, than you and I do today. So if they were going to be saved, they were going to be saved by the grace of God. They were going to be able to overcome sin by the indwelling of God's Spirit, which is the same way we do today. Is that right? Okay, so God has a plan. And he tells Habakkuk that you would not believe it, though it were told to you. They come for violence, their faces are set like the east wind, and they gather captives like sand. Well, wow, that doesn't sound too promising, does it? Now again, I want you to understand, because I've met people again who just, they don't like the Old Testament because it's too violent, and, and they just, they think that's a different God than the God of the New Testament. Here, this is what I've had somebody explain to me. That was the Father. The New Testament is Jesus the Son. And it's like, do you really read? Because the New Testament tells you that it was Christ who went with them in the desert. It was Christ who was with them the whole time that they were a nation. So this God that is sending this plan is none other than Jesus Christ. Amen. So that Jesus Christ that we love today, who is full of grace and mercy, was still full of grace and mercy then. What we need to understand today is that there's coming a day when God is going to stand up and He will send His judgments as he sent there, he will do today. Have you ever read the book of Revelation? Yes. yes. I think if people are just nice to one another, God will go easy on them. 
<laughs> what we have been called to do is to, me as the pastor here, is I have a duty to make sure that you understand where we're at in history. And that you know God and you understand just what's about to take place. Raise your hands if you believe that we're living in the last days. Now keep them raised, raise them up high and look around. What happens in the last days? The last days means something is going to end, right? Because it's the last days. What's going to end? The world. And so if the world ends, do you think that's going to be a nice time? You think it's going to end gently? You're just going to sleep one night and everything ends? Again, have you read the book of Revelation? So, people have to be warned, they have to be told, and God's people have to be prepared. Now, raise your hand if you believe there's going to be a secret rapture. Yeah, a secret rapture. Because if there's no secret rapture, it means you're going to be here when the end comes. That's not me. <laughs> so if you're here when the end comes, you will live through that time. And you will live through that time by your faith. What does it say, Ricky? The just shall live by faith. No, what did you tell me last week? Right? The just shall live by his faith, right? Yes. So listen now, that's, that's very important. I'm glad you brought this out because... The just shall live by their faith. That's more corporate, right? But when you say the just shall live by his faith, that's individual. Amen. I can't save you. This church can't save you. You have the power and the decision to accept Christ as an individual, and you have the choices to make every day to decide on an individual if you will walk with your God. Amen. Your parents can't do it for you. Your siblings can't do it for you. Okay? You and your God. You're thinking. Ricky, did you have your hand up first? Yeah. The uh, uh, Hebrews 12, 2 says that Jesus is the author and the finisher of faith. faith. Very good, very good, right? I just want to digress for a second because this whole thing about people wanting to throw away the Old Testament, that, that just bothers me. Because, I mean, you have the cross and the New Testament, but if you don't have the Old Testament, you don't have the substance of what the cross is all about. Amen. In, in, all, in, in all the books of the Bible meet their end in the book of Revelation. Amen. The book of Revelation is Jesus Christ, so the whole Bible is about Jesus. <clears throat> Amen. Now, when I tell you this, have you ever heard of the word dispensationalists? Those are those that, you know, those are different dispensations. Yes? There's about 400 quotations out of the Old Testament in Revelation. Just in Revelation alone. Right. If you take all the quotations out of the whole New Testament, quotations from the Old Testament, it's the majority of the entire New Testament. Amen. Okay. So let's get back to this. Rosa, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, could you dwell a little bit more on the secret rapture? <laughs> the secret rapture. Listen, the secret rapture is a teaching that many people uh, believe in. It is a very prevalent teaching of the day today. You have movies that are based on that teaching. The Left Behind series. Uh, a lot of your Christian denominations... Uh, believe in the rapture. They are uh, tend to be futurists in their interpretation of Scripture. What the rapture is, is they believe that before the seven last plagues are poured out, before this great time of trouble that's spoken of in Daniel, the church will be raptured out. And so they believe that when that happens, Christians, and it's only the Christian church that are raptured out, then the Jews are left, and this is the second chance for the Jews. Now, think this through. Before this happens, they believe that the temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt, you know, the one where the Muslim uh, the Dome of the Rock is on. You're going to have to get that out of there. 
They'll build the temple. They will start the sacrifices all over again. And then the church is raptured. Secret rapture. Okay, then, you know, the planes are flying in the air. The pilot is a Christian and he's raptured out. Sorry about the guys that are, you know, you're driving in your car, the guy next to you, he's a taxi driver, he's a Christian, he's raptured out, so don't know what happens in that car. But anyway, what it does is it gives the Jews their second chance that they will accept Christ at that time. How can that happen? Jim. If they start up a sacrificial service again, then why did Christ die on the cross? Exactly. So the secret rapture is just a way to make Christians not afraid to deal with that aspect of the last part of Earth's history. But we are here to tell you there is no secret rapture. Number one, you won't find that word rapture, and you won't find the word secret rapture. Ricky? Yeah, you know, what, what it does, it, it makes people think they're going to get another chance. It's only in the spring. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah, that's right. So let's, so if there's no secret rapture and God's people, just like the children of Israel when the, uh, the ten plagues were poured out, remember that? Ten plagues poured out? Did God rapture the Israelites out of there? Where were they at? They were right there, but none of the plagues touched them. And it will be the same way in the last days when the seven last plagues are sent out. God's people will be here on this planet. And you have to have a relationship with God that is strong enough to allow you to believe that God is real, that He loves you, and that He's still in control when the earth is coming to an end. Amen. If you guys lose your faith when things get bad now... And they're not really bad compared to that time. How are you going to keep your faith strong when the world is coming to an end? Can I just read this one scripture? Because this is the scripture that they use to try to prove this, but they only read half the scripture. Okay. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. I don't see any secret about that. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. There's nothing secret. That's right. Nothing. Yes. I think that the world will always be here. You might want to read the scriptures because, well, the world will be here the way it is now. It will not always be here. Floating rock. Okay. What the Bible tells you. You can find this in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah saw the earth as it was a drunkard, reeling to and fro. Okay? And there was no man upon the earth. Okay? What is he seeing? He's seeing in vision what happens at that last day. Understand this. When Jesus comes back, what are the events that take place? Jesus comes back the second time. The church is not raptured out. The church is still here. The righteous who are alive are caught up with those who have been resurrected. Because the Bible says together. See, the rapturists believe that Christ brings them back with him. Okay? The righteous are here. Why do you think it says, Lo, this is our God. He will save us. He has come for us. Okay? Christ comes, the righteous alive, look and see him coming. The righteous dead are called out of their graves. They are resurrected. They wait, and together they are caught up into the clouds to meet Jesus in the air because his feet never touched the ground.